Number 10, Rasputin. Okay, technically not a kingly leader, but he was a religious leader and the way he died is crazy. If it weren't for the technicality alone, he would probably be number one. Bold statement, I know. It took everything for this dude to die. He was the Russian Tsarina's favorite, but people thought he was the Antichrist. Just to prove such a claim, on June 29th, 1914, a courtesan named Guseva gutted him in the belly until she was satisfied. Once she'd done the deed, she stepped back and proclaimed, I I have killed the Antichrist. So there you go, people believed it. But they made another attempt on his life. On December 16th, 1916, Rasputin's enemies tried to kill him once again. This time, they laced the cake with enough cyanide to kill five grown men. But Rasputin was fine. No reaction whatsoever. What the heck? Frustrated, a man named Yusupov shot him several times and then left him for dead. He returned later to fetch the body, but instead he found a bloody and angry zombie Rasputin. As Rasputin was chasing him, another noble shot him and this time he died? I don't know. To make sure they threw him into the river. After his body was recovered, an autopsy revealed he had water in his lungs, meaning the man was still alive before he drowned. After burying him for a time, they dug him up to burn his body, and while he burned, he appeared to sit up in the flames, though this is most likely due to the fact that they didn't cut his tendons, so it was just a result of like him shriveling up. But still, took a lot of tries, my man. Took a lot of tries. Number nine, King Charles VIII. If you haven't learned yet to take care of head injuries, then you need to take first aid because that's like the number one rule. There ain't no room to mess around, anything could happen. Take Charles VIII for example. He was the king of France in the late 15th century and became king at just the age of 13. Unlike his conniving father, he was described as pleasant and likable. Charles the Affable, so he was called. But in his 28th year, the king would face his demise in a way no one suspected. In a tennis court of all places. He was really keen to catch a match and as he was rushing to watch it, he knocked his head on a door frame really hard. He got up and said he was fine and enjoyed some of the game, but halfway through, he collapsed. Physicians requested he not be moved for fear of increasing his injury, so they made a makeshift bed in the stands where he spent his last hours of life. He died on a tennis court of all places. Number eight, King Barbarossa. Fate was laughing, man. Fate was freaking laughing. Had Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa managed to join Richard the Lionheart for his crusade, it would have most definitely turned out differently. Barbarossa was legendary for his skill in battle and military expertise. He was one of the most highly feared leaders in the crusades with a ferocious army behind him. But on June 10th, 1190, fate would intervene. He was leading his troops into Turkey on their way and came across a river they had to cross. His men recommended that they find a bridge to cross instead, but Barbarossa was confident that they could cross it on horseback. He rode his horse into the waves, but his horse wasn't strong enough to withstand the current and Frederick's metallic form because he was wearing a lot of armor. It was his armor that ended up dragging the two beneath the depths. After his death, his army completely fell apart because they panicked and they never made it to the Holy Land, but this guy literally got dragged underwater by the weight of his armor. That's how he died. Number seven, Humayun. Humayun was one of the Mughal kings of the Mughal Empire who faced a lot of political strife during his reign, from his brothers and outside enemies. But in 1555, he finally won back Delhi and recovered a throne once lost to him. The whole kingdom cheered him on, with crowds lining the streets to welcome him home. After everything he went through, he was right to party. Despite his brothers being a huge reason as to why he was kicked off the throne in the first place, his father on his deathbed was like, dude, you can't kill your brother, so he had to forgive them but blinded them so they could never become king. But his victory wouldn't last long. He died in the most unpredictable way. He was walking up to the tower towards his library, arms full of books, when he tripped and fell. He fell so hard and fast that he fractured his skull, and thus was the end of his legacy. Number six, Sato. This is probably one of the darkest ones that I have ever read. It's horrendous, uh, but it's also like, uh, does the crime match the punishment? We don't know. The Crown Prince Sato of Korea was known to be quite the terror. He had a terrible relationship with his father growing up, who was also abusive and bullied and tore him down since birth, which definitely led to his cruel behavior later in life. 
However, the things he did, still inexcusable. Sato was prone to violent outbursts and his subjects knew him to be a cruel violator, bully and even took the lives of some of his servants with his own bare hands. His father got to the point where he had to figure out a way to remove him as his successor. The boy turned into such a horrendous figure, his parents weren't so great either mind you, that his mother, his own mother condemned him to death. Now they could have hung him, they could have done anything other than this, but this is what they did. There are a lot more humane ways to take someone's life, but did they do any of them? No. Instead they locked their own son into a rice chest for 8 days until he suffocated to death. Once he was gone, the chest was open. Rough way to go. Number 5. William the Second. William the Second was the third son of the great William the Conqueror. As we know from the first video, he also died in an anticlimactic yet explosive way. It was only fitting that his son died in a similar fashion, however his death was a drop more menacing. There were some creepy things behind it. On August 2nd, my birthday. In 1100, King William II was on a hunting trip in New Forest. He was attended by a few people, one in particular was named Walter Tyrell. Tyrell wasn't a huge fan of the king and there were some musings as to whether he was employed by uh, William's other brother. We'll see. William got in his sight a stag, took aim, and fired. He didn't kill it, but injured the animal and in his excitement ran towards it. Walter Tyrell stayed back and took advantage of the situation and just went right into his heart. He strung his own bow and struck the king right in the heart. He fled immediately and was able to escape. When the rest of the party discovered him, they too fled in an attempt to protect their own interests. It was left to the countrymen to ferry the king to the cathedral for his burial because actually it turns out people weren't a huge fan of him, to be honest. Number 4. King Adolf Frederick Last time we talked about one of the King Henrys dying from a surfeit of lamprey, but he wasn't the only king to eat himself to death. Spoiler alert. King Adolf Frederick, the king of Sweden, had no way of knowing as he sat down for a meal on Shrove Tuesday Day, the night before Lent in 1771 that it would be his last supper. He was just hoping for a good time. Lots of people loved him as king. He was a big part of the Age of Liberty during which civil rights for civil people increased. It was his parliament that saw the first legislation supporting freedom of the press and freedom of information get passed. But that night, the night before Lent, Frederick had a meal that included lobster, caviar, kippers, sauerkraut, boiled meats and turnips. Surely enough to more than satisfy satisfied the average man, but he washed it down with champagne and semlas, a decadent dessert. He ate 14 of them, on top of everything else plus a bowl of warm milk, cinnamon and raisins. That same day, he had such severe indigestion that the king died that day. Number 3. Martin of Aragon People didn't initially get excited when Martin of Aragon took the throne over Aragon, Valencia, Sicily, Sardinia and Corsica, but he was later referred to as Martin the Humane. So. He wasn't that bad, I guess. But no one would have guessed he would die the way that he did. Martin, like some other kings we know, also had an unhealthy appetite. Apparently, Joey from Friends could have died in that one episode of Friends where he tried to eat a whole turkey because Martin took on eating an entire goose by himself and actually did it. Something about the goose didn't agree with him and soon he retired to bed with frightful indigestion. He called for his jester to entertain him while he was ill, but the jester took a long time to get there. When he finally appeared, he told what would be the world's deadliest joke. When asked where he went, the jester replied, in the next vineyard your majesty, where I saw a young deer hanging by his tail from a tree as if somebody had punished him for stealing figs." Unquote. Apparently this was so funny, Martin laughed for three hours until he died. So yes, he quite literally laughed himself to death. Number 2. Cleopatra I would be very surprised if anyone watching this video doesn't know who Cleopatra is, but in case you don't, here it is, here you go. Cleopatra was one of, if not the, most famous pharaoh to come out of ancient Egypt. She has inspired countless plays and movies surrounding her rule, her beauty, but most notably her love affairs with Caesar and Mark Antony. Her death is for sure up there with fictional Shakespearean characters Romeo and Juliet. Mark Antony was Caesar's general who fell deeply in love with Cleopatra. Antony had 
had first met the young, silver-tongued, charming, and scholarly queen when she was young and involved with Caesar. After Caesar's assassination, though, she was wide open, quite literally. The two had a passionate, at times messy, and later tragic love affair. Cleopatra at one time faked a suicide to try and bring back her lover from danger, but upon finding out, Antony fled to her only to make an attempt on his own life. He died in her very arms. The queen retreated with her servants to her mausoleum. There, along with her servants, she let an asp clamp on her wrist to take her life. This is the tale, but with no corpse to evaluate. And and lots of legend and hearsay. Some say this, though popular, wasn't the true cause of death, but hey, tragedy sells tickets. And last but not least, King Tut. Following the path we are embarking, here we have another mysterious death in ancient Egypt. That of the one, the only, King Tutankhamun. The discovery of his mummified corpse sparked decades of rumor and curses after several people involved with the excavation died mysteriously. But the bigger mystery became how the famous ruler died at so young an age of 19. DNA tests and computerized tomography revealed he was suffering from malaria, a fractured lower leg, congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, makes sense because his father and his mother got it on and that's how he came about and so did his grandparents. Egyptians were big into incest. But that wasn't his main cause of death. Other CT scans showed he had a cleft palate, a long head, curved spine, and a fusion of the upper vertebrae. He either died of sickness or a wretched accident given his broken leg. One theory is that he died during a chariot race. Another theory is that he was attacked by a hippopotamus. No doubt archaeologists will still keep searching for the real cause, but will we ever know? I don't know. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike. <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair if the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramesseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the you know 200 wives, otherwise ow and how, if it was just one person. Ow and how, you know? It's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know, maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint, just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. We gotta love him, her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904 when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas, let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living and after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol, AKA an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies Shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me, if anything. DC Skate Shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world, that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star, like a literal star. 
There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bowl worshiping. So if you're a fan of bowls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the steppe pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass and also terrifying, that's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Tonight at Saqqara, there's a massive vault, it's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock, it's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around, especially at these times, like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I'm allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them, I risk everything just to, yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it. They're cute. They respected them. They worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat will just be like... No, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good, hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair. I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you. What should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack. Make him jacked. I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan. I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God. Gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days. But nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You would have to pee on them. And then, however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crop, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. And it worked a lot of the time, it's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. 
More tattoos for number two. We love it, you guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshiped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party apparently. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo on one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here, I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like. Thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. 